Welcome. This is the third in our series that we started in the spring. And this will be on grasses, grasses and grass-like plants for the California Native Garden. As usual, we start with our spiritual approach to gardening, which keeps us out of trying to force solutions that won't work. We ask for the serenity to accept the things we cannot change in our gardens, including climate, rain, animals, etc. Then we ask for the courage to change the things we can in our gardens which for me involve my own attitude, my own mood, my own expectations. And always I ask for the wisdom to know the difference so that I don't beat my head against the wall on things that I can't actually change. And then I have a serene morning in the garden. Okay, let's take about three minutes and as we often do, let's focus on tonight's objective and take, a, take two to three minutes. If you have a pencil and a piece of paper, that's good. What I'd like you to do is, as you're participating tonight, keep your eye out for some grasses that might work in two areas of your yard. One, a, a full sun area, and one, an area with some shade. So maybe one of your areas is the front of your driveway. Maybe there are some boulders or some rocks there or just an open area. It's great if there are boulders, but some of these grasses do fine without them. And then think about also a shady area, whether it's shady because of, of a structure shading it or even under the shade of a live oak or a blue oak. And then at the end, We'll give you another three minutes to formulate your plan. So let's take three minutes starting now. Um, two parts of your yard. And um, actually, we only need two minutes. So choose those parts of your yard and write them down if you can. Even draw them. Um, small, small areas, 20 by 20, something like that. But just for a start. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, this class is on California native grasses for our gardens, including sedges and rushes, as well as grasses, which are grass-like plants, even though they're not technically grasses. 
And Elaine, you might recognize the format of this very first slide. And um, I want all of you to know that in attendance tonight is Elaine Mills from Virginia. When I was doing research for this class, I found her presentation on native grasses, sedges, and rushes in Virginia that she prepared for the master gardeners there. And I thought that her, the format, the outline, the structure, and the overall presentation were so excellent that I was like, why should I reinvent the wheel? So I asked her permission. And I've used, um, I used a lot of it as placeholders for me and um, was inspired by a lot of what she said and how she said it. So um, thank you again, Elaine, and I'm really glad you could make it tonight. Thank you very much. Of course. So why do we have a separate class on grasses, sedges, and rushes? Um, they're a separate category and they have separate uses. We care about them because unlike many of our plants, they provide year round interest, even though many of them are green part of the year and brown part of the year. They can provide a backdrop for other plants. So a smaller plant or a different plant with the grasses behind it looks framed. They provide structure in the garden. You'll see a lot of examples of that. I use that a lot and I use, we use that at the Salvia Creek Garden. We use the grasses for structure, meaning a skeleton. They tend to be easy. Stick them in a gopher basket, plant them correctly, water them deeply, and then respect their needs and they'll tend to do very well. And once a year, you might wanna rake them or cut them to the ground. Each one is different. And many of our native grasses have very deep root systems that stabilize soils and prevent erosion. So they'll, they're very useful on slopes. And I know many of you struggle with slopes and stabilizing slopes. Okay, now, when many of us think of grass in the garden, this is what we think of, right? What we grew up with. This is turf grass that was sold to as sod in many cases. Um, it's very shallow rooted grass that spreads aggressively by runners. And it did this great. It made things green. You watered it every day or twice a day and you mowed it once a week and it looked like you were keeping up with the Joneses. No more. Um, it's a desert. I don't wanna say it's a desert for wildlife because deserts are full of life. It's an empty slate for wildlife. It's a disaster in terms of habitat. It actually strangles and compacts the soil. When you kill off turf grasses like Bermuda grass, um, the soil um, will take years to recover. Um, and it's old school from old values. Um, so we're not talking about this kind of grass. We're also not talking about these kind of grasses. These are the ones we all have in our yards, right? The ones that we have to weed whack every year, once or twice, to prevent the spread of fire in our yards. Um, the, those grasses, you guys, that we see in our yards, they are with almost no exceptions. They are not native to California. They were introduced in the 19th century when Europeans arrived and brought cattle with them, among other things. The cattle were introduced into the range. They still had the seed in their hooves and in their guts. And that little bit of seed turned into Western North America covered with these grasses that outcompeted our native grasses from our grasslands. Most of the grasses in our grasslands and elsewhere are bunch grasses. In other words, it's a clump of grass that grows, that that crump, clump grows. Um, they're not turf grasses that go like this and they're not annual grasses. 
So these are annual grasses. These will die every year, set seed, and come up again the next year, okay? Um, they strangle and eliminate native ecosystems um, because they evolved in a place where they, uh, when they got to California, it was way easier for them to proliferate than they could in their native areas. So they went crazy and crowded out everybody else. It's kind of like the grasses version of um, gentrification. Um, and they actually can inhibit growth of native species. I saw some research this week that's done where you take purple needle grass and you take a a, a bromus, a brome grass that's not native and you plant them and you do various things and it actually inhibits germination and growth of native grasses. Okay, we plant native species instead. This is deer grass and purple needle grass. This is blue wild rye, Elemis glaucus, here. In the, near the chair and the blue oak, not in the distance. In the distance are our exotic grasses. This is blue rye in the foreground and deer grass in the background. There is still a California invasive grass, an invasive grass of California that is not native, that's still sold all over the place. It's called Mexican feather grass. Many of you have probably either planted it or seen it. Um, this is it, it's lovely. It's feathery and wispy and it blows in the wind and it reseeds really easily. In fact, this woman in Los Angeles who had this beautiful portfolio, it showed up over here. I was like, dude, no, um, oops, sorry. Um, so be careful. When you see Mexican feather grass in the nursery, please don't buy it. It's Stipa tenuissima Mexican feather grass. And if you have the gumption, let the nursery owner know that that is a California invasive grass. Okay, now, the three types of plants that we're talking about tonight are all called graminoids which means a plant that resembles grasses and includes sedges and rushes. And they can fill many roles. They can be specimens in the landscape. Here we have from left to right, we have Canyon Prince wild rye, we have San Diego sedge, and we have deer grass. They're awesome in containers. This is just on the left, a California needle grass that I, I took that this morning. It reseeded in there, I just let it go. And on the right is San Diego sedge, which is a Carex spissa. It's a spectacular plant for containers. It's great for lining pathways. That's my backyard in 2015 and in 2021 with deer grass lining the pathway. It's spectacular when combined with other plants. This is deer grass and celestial blue sage. Contrast, this is at our Salvia Creek garden where in the back we have our beautiful Dr. Herd Manzanita and in the front a deer grass just adding depth and richness to the textures. When you have a solid surface, these graminoids can look spectacular and soften the edges. You can create repetition and patterns with these grasses and because they tend to look so distinctive in the landscape, they're very effective at that. They can survive in the toughest condition, conditions, as you can see right there. This is a grass we're not covering tonight, but it's a California native grass and check out the root system. When that spreads out, 
and that's not even as deep as many of our grasses get, that holds the soil together, it binds the soil and helps prevent erosion. And as Elaine reminded me to remind you, tremendous pleasure for the senses. Movement. Color. Light. Grasses have a way of catching the light in every season. Photographers love them for this reason, but they're magical in the fall. And a sense of place. That is a wild area in Oakhurst. And it was really after that kind of look under this live oak that I modeled my deer grass under my live oak. This is where we live, guys. And then these three types of plants have certain characteristics that I want to go over quickly before we get into specific plants. Okay, sedges, rushes, and grasses. There's a funny little saying that's very common, which is how sometimes we remember. Sedges have edges, rushes are round, and grasses have joints all the way to the ground. And you'll see that happen, but they're not talking about the leaves, the blades so much, but the stems of these plants. There are distinctions in the flowers as well, but we're not gonna cover those tonight. Okay, starting with grasses. The stems, which you can see here, they're hollow, okay? So if you're ever like, is this a sedge or is this a reed or is this a rush or is this a grass? Break the stem if you can do so without damaging the plant. If it's hollow, it's a grass. Also grasses have nodes along the stems, meaning spots where it looks like some other plantlet could emerge. I don't know the technical term, but you can, a node, you know, it's a place where, where other life can come out of. Grasses have them along their stems and their leaf blades are flat. And again, without going into detail, grasses are monocots. That means that when the seed sprouts, there is only a single leaf, as opposed to say a sunflower, is a dicotyledon, a dicot, which means when it comes out, it has two leaves, you'll see. Bulbs and grasses and tubers are all monocots, so your daffodils, and they have vertical veining in their leaves. Grasses are monocots. The name of their scientific family is Poaceae. They can be either annuals or perennials, but every grass we're covering tonight is a perennial. And they pretty much grow during one season and stop growing the next, the next half of a year or so, and many of them die back. Grasses are considered, and this is important, either cool or warm season plants, meaning they put out new growth during the cool weather or during the warm weather. They tend to be abundant in dry open habitats and they have fibrous roots. Sedges. The stems can be literally triangular. You can feel them. They can be triangular around and they are not hollow. They have, a, they have pith in the center. They have a solid center. They have no nodes. And the leaf blades are flat, but they can be stiff and edgy. So you can actually get a paper cut um, with some sedge leaves. They're also monocots. They're members of the Cyperaceae family. Um, we are covering the genus called Carex. Primarily perennials mostly evergreen, 
and many of them prefer mo moist or wet environments. But as you'll see, some of them are drought tolerant. And finally, rushes, which I adore. Um, the stems are round and pithy. There are no nodes along the stem. So you can take your fingers and go all the way up a reed and it's just this solid tube. The leaf blades are flat or cylindrical. They're also monocots. They're members of the Junkaceae, Junkaceae family, primarily perennials. They are evergreen, which is a big deal. They enjoy moist or wet environments, but many do fine with drought or in the sun. But these are some of these, you can literally have a pond and put this plant in the pond and it will thrive. Okay. Phew. Questions? I have one, Leslie. Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, so this is not a native plant, I know. But, you know, the um, horsetail uh, rushes? They, yes, some of them are native. Equisetum hymenale, I think. Okay, but as I think of a rut, uh, of the horsetails, they are round, but don't they have where they have those joints? That's interesting. They yeah. are not, they, they are a graminoid, but no, they may not be a graminoid. Do you know this, Elaine? Um, they, I don't yeah. know that they are a sedge or a, or a rush. Yeah, I'm, I'm not certain, uh, Leslie. Yeah, so yeah, the horsetails are a wonderful plant that are native, but um, I, don't, I, I don't know that there are any of these things in. Yeah, I know. I was going through your criteria and trying to make them fit. Yeah. It, it didn't fit. So, yeah. um, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It, it wasn't meant to be a stumping uh, problem at all. for you. It was just like, oh, what about those? They're round. They should be a rush, but they don't check all the other boxes. Uh, oh, yeah. they, I've, I've just been looking. Um, they are a perennial herbaceous plant. So they're, I, I guess they're not a graminoid. Yeah. Yeah. And they reproduce by spores. Yeah. They're very primitive. Well, let's so, see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Leslie, um, I also have some questions when you're ready. Okay. Um, how do you get rid of exotic grasses? That's a whole other subject. Um, and uh, if you are going to try to create some kind of a, if you have, you weed whack them <laughs> and you mulch when you mulch at exactly this time of year when they're dead and they haven't germinated, the seeds haven't germinated yet. If you are going to mulch your yards, guys, rush and do it before it rains. This is the time to do it. If you add three inches of mulch where you had that grass, three to four, you will have very little germination of grasses. So you weed whack and you mulch. You do not use pesticides um, at all. Thank you. Also, do all grasses, et cetera, need to be planted in gopher cages? Here, I'm sorry that unless your property is completely different from mine or anyone else in this group who I've worked with, yes. Gopher cages in every case. And, okay. And I apologize if I mispronounce any of these words. So. Um, Bev planted Cesleria, uh -huh. is that correct? Yep. Um, Campo Azul from T and V, does that fit one of these categories? It looks grassy. I'm not, you know, it might actually be native. Uh, no, Eurasian and North African. 
but it is in the Poaceae family. So it is a grass technically, but it is not native to California. Thank you. And um, dear grass seedlings are monocot. I'm waiting for seeds to sprout. Two leaf seedlings are coming up. How long does it take to germinate? If they're coming, germination is the action of the seed sprouting that leaf. So maybe I don't understand the question. So Leslie, I yeah. planted the deer grass seeds about uh -huh. three weeks ago. Uh-huh. In the yard or, or in a flat? In pots. Yeah, I have them in pots. Great. And um, all kinds of other things are coming up. So I just learned, I'm assuming deer grass is monocot. It should just have one leaf coming up or a couple leaves straight. One leaf. straight leaf. Yes. Yeah. So... Other things are coming up with two leaves. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. does that mean I need to wait longer? Because I found there's hardly any information on planting deer grass as far as what to look for and what the seedlings look look like. I um, haven't found anything. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to send you to three sources for seeds and information on propagating from seed. Okay. And all of these places will have good information for you. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, I think we need to move on. Let's. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, guys. Okay, here's the idea about cool versus warm season. Cool season grasses in my yard right now are, are brown, unless I've been watering them. If I've been watering them, they still have some green, but they're basically brown. And most of them, I will cut off any remaining things. And once the rains come, if the rains come, they will get green so that by February or March, they'll be growing in green. And by late spring, they'll be, they'll be fully in. Then when the weather gets very hot, well, and then they will send up their reproductive parts, their flowers, most of them in, in uh, late spring, early summer, and then they will go dormant, which means they'll brown after that. Warm season grasses, um, uh, if they are not evergreen, warm season grasses, I'll cut to the ground because they're basically dead. They'll be dead um, during the winter. Some of them even vanish completely. Um, cut them to the ground, and then when the weather warms up is when they start to fill in. So your cool season grasses will be nice and green and lush, and your warm season grasses will just be kind of starting in late spring. Warm season grasses will bloom in the summer, late summer, and then they'll go dormant during the cool season. Okay, it'll make more sense as we go through. We're gonna start with cool season grasses. Okay, this is our state grass. California uh, state grass is purple needle grass, Stipa pulchra. It's right here. These three next grasses are called needle grasses because if you look at the flower, so on a grass, the flower is the part at the very end of the stem. Um, those are flowers, that's where the seeds are produced. And the seeds or achenes actually have a needle-like protuberance on them. You can see in this grass, those sharp needle-like areas. And it, they're actually so heavy that they pull those blades down um, on purple needle grass. Um, it gets about three feet tall. It's a cool season grass. It will get completely brown in the summer unless you water it. If you give it some water, it'll stay somewhat green. It's a great plant for slope stabilization because it's terrific for erosion control. Intersperse it with other native perennials though. Um, don't just do solid needle grass. Um, extremely drought tolerant 
and it reseeds like crazy. So uh, be aware that it might do that. If you plant it in gravel, you will be able to, you will cover that gravel with needle grass pretty quickly, probably, if you want to. Fabulous plant and very important right here in Corskull. It's a native right here. Here are some in various stages in my own yard. On the left, this is the way they look in the, this was probably February. So they haven't bloomed yet, but they're nice and green. And then in the middle, you can see that they've bloomed. That would be like June where they've, they're just beautiful. They have these stems that are swaying. It could be a little later than June. You can see them in the foreground in the middle as well, guys. See that pretty kind of silvery white looking uh, flower. And then on the right, again, um, more purple needle grass. Here's a nodding needle grass, Stipus cernua, also native here in coarse gold. About two to three feet tall. It's also a cool season grass, also good for erosion control, very drought tolerant, recedes like crazy. It's a little more delicate looking than the purple needle grass. Some people find the purple needle grass, they use the word coarse. I mean, to me, it's coarse like a pearl is coarse, you know, compared to a stainless steel orb or something. It's not, it's not coarse. Um, uh, yeah, and here it is. The flower is not quite as large and the leaves are not as large. Foothill needlegrass, step, Stipa lepida. This one's a little different than the other two in that even though this picture doesn't show it, the flowers are a lot smaller. And so the grass tends to stay more upright because the weight of the flowers doesn't weigh down the leaves. And often you can get all three of these or at least two out of three of them in pony packs, which are packs of eight or six at Intermountain Nursery. Here's a wonderful California native cool season grass. California fescue, Festuca californica. It gets about a, a foot and a half tall with just the leaves and then it blooms another foot and a half or so with this beautiful bloom. Um, it does not want to be in full sun. It likes to be under the shade of oaks, filtered shade, not heavy shade. Um, it's used in areas of California for large restoration or revegetation projects. It used to cover huge areas of California before those areas were invaded by the exotic European grasses. Um, I bought mine at Luis Nursery, um, and it was the first local nurse, the first place I found them um, since I've been here. Here they are on the left. Um, in a garden and you can see that the, the grass itself is very graceful and lovely and those airy, um, delicate, graceful, blooming stems. Okay, here's my, one of my, here's one of my first videos tonight. Yes, these are my four California fescue. Estuca, California this was today. Planted in probably February or March. I got them at Luis Nursery and they were doing really well. And bunnies, bunnies. Oh, Mr. Bunny. Yeah. Um, so I think that this year I'm just simply going to put them, I'm going to cage them and see what happens. Because they're growing fine and they're under the shade of this oak, which is where they want to be. That's a cool season grass, which is why it's brown now, right? After this long, hot summer, a cool season grass will not be looking its best. I give them a little bit of extra moisture, not a lot. They're all in cages. In cages. 
condom cages. So the roots are okay. So we'll see. Worth a try, guys. Okay. By the way, you see that beautiful template that grass is resting on? That is all um, chipped wood from felled trees on my property, along with the oak leaves that have fallen from the live oak above. Okay, here's another fescue. This is Idaho fescue, which is actually common in many areas of the United States. It's a wonderful plant for the California native garden. And in fact, is so popular that there are many different selections that have made that's like a little bit more blue, a little bit more green, a little bit more this, a little bit more that for like Los Angeles native plant designers who like match it with the paint color. And, you know, <laughs> for us, we're like, it's growing, it's a success, but you know, to each her own, right? So <laughs> But anyway, Idaho fescue is a wonderful native plant. And I'm sorry, but I appear to have not gotten any of the uh, bullet points over here. Basically, um, it's extremely drought tolerant. It enjoys full sun. On the left are three Idaho fescue that I planted very early on in my yard and just loved them. And they failed. And I don't know why. And I'm sure it was my fault. Um, but I wanted you to see how lovely they are. And that was their first year. On the right is some selection of Idaho fescue with this much bluer leaf. And on the top of that, this is from Calscape. Calscape.org is a wonderful website for gardening with California native plants. And just so you can see, that's just a a, num a few of the selections available in nurseries that have slightly different characteristics um, for Idaho fescue. This is an area in my garden where I bought 12 Elijah Blues about three years ago because this area is so um, overrun by squirrels that I couldn't get anything else to live. So I just decided that I would just pepper it with these lovely little punctuation um, points. Of course, I put 12 of them in and then realized they are not native. Um, they are a hybrid of the non-native Festuca glauca and our Idaho fescue. Um, but at any rate, um, I love them anyway. And on the right, you can see, I just absolutely love the neatness, neatness of the little blue tuft and then that lovely bloom coming out. And the tufts will grow, but they stay neat like this. Um, okay, this is a yet a different kind of fescue. And unlike all of the others, this is not a bunch grass. It doesn't grow in clumps. It spreads by rhizomes, meaning that um, this part of the plant goes sideways and sprouts other stems and leaves from its lateral roots, so to speak. And because of that and its other characteristics, this has become a very popular plant in California for replacing traditional turf grass lawns. Now, um, as you can see on the right, if it's unmowed, it has this kind of very sort of casual collapsed look. On the left, you see the mowed version. Now, these, you might be able to get a small area of your yard here to work with red fescue, um, one of the selections that's recommended, um, but it will require supplemental water. And I recommend you not do it in absolutely full sun. So if you have a dog or you have another need for something that looks like, like a, a lawn, it's something to consider. This is yet another cool season grass and it is not a fescue, it's a rye grass. 
blue wild rye, Elemis glaucus. It is native in this area. It reseeds and naturalizes here. So I wanted to show you in my own garden, I put in one six pack of this, maybe two, about five years ago that I purchased at Intermountain. And um, Bonnie, who used to own Intermountain, said to me as I was buying it, Leslie, you know, this gets like six feet tall. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Of course, I, you know, um, I, I, I didn't say that to her, but I thought that's fine with me. I need something that will naturalize um, in my yard that's native here. And in fact, I absolutely love it, even though it's quite inconvenient that the blossoms, that the, that the leaves and the flowers get so tall. Um, this is it in the spring. Um, it has naturalized in that area and it lines that path. And it's, I, I think it's beautiful. Um, you can see on the left, this is, this is it under a live oak in the springtime. And on the right, it's under the live oak today or in the, in the summer. So um, because of our fire, you do want to cut it down when it gets dry. Um, it would tolerate mowing, but I just cut mine with pruners because it's so easy. I'm out here on a back slope in my yard where I have a blue oak and underneath have naturalized these um, blue wild rye grasses that I got in a six pack at Intermountain a few years ago. Um, it's called Elemis glaucus. And this whole thing used to be rosemary that was planted in 1992. And um, I gradually removed it. And I took special care to remove it from underneath the leaf line, the canopy of the blue oak, sorry, awkward footing. Um, so it was all rosemary and I uh, planted these grasses and <laughs> they receded, they've naturalized. So you can see that here's the blue oak and then I've tried to get it so that almost everything within the canopy and even beyond for this blue oak is native so that the mycorrhizal networks can establish and contribute to the health of this blue oak. Plus creating habitat, of course, always. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess that's self-explanatory. Okay, here's another rye that I've never planted. Preston, I don't know if you're here, but I think you tried this. Is Preston here? Shoot, I guess not. He tried it, I think, in his Corona garden. Anyway, this is a nut. This is used in restoration projects. In fact, the first place I ever saw it grow was in, in Visalia along the river. There's been a, a native restoration project that's been going on for a very long time. And I saw that Las Pilitas Nursery had done a restoration project there and they had used the creeping wild rye. Um, unlike the, the rye we just looked at, this spreads by rhizomes. So it has a way of, of um, it can revegetate an area more easily because it, it spreads out laterally, right? Um, but it does require regular water. Um, in fact, it, it tends to be native near waterways. Um, it can spread very aggressively into large areas, which can be good for us here, but I'm afraid it probably needs too much water for us here. But if somebody wants to try, I'm not stopping them. Okay, here's a real, this is a, a plant that's actually made it into the California nursery trade mainstream. Um, it's a wild rye, um, which is Elemis condensatus, which in the wild can get like eight, eight feet tall or taller and huge, like almost like pompous grass, like insane. But this is a smaller, more compact one that still ends up being rather dramatic 
in a garden landscape because of its size, texture, and foliage color. So it's really beautiful. Um, uh, it'll get three feet tall and six feet wide if it takes. Now, um, I've tried several, they've done okay, but they haven't done the way they look in the pictures, in the, in the books and the websites and the pictures. So you know me, I don't like to recommend plants to you if I haven't person, personally witnessed their success in YLP. So this one, I'm gonna show you some pictures of it in my yard, but um, it's worth trying in my opinion. Um, don't put it in, well, maybe try it in absolutely full sun. I hadn't done that. Mm, it's tricky, okay? Tricky, but might be worth it. Here's one in my yard. It's many years old. It's in part sun. Um, I know it looks kind of sad here. It doesn't look this sad most of the time, but it really has not done what I had hoped it would do. I planted three of these in my, under my big live oak. Okay, this is, oh, shoot, wait a minute. Oh yeah, it's called reed grass, but it's not a reed. Okay, this is, I think it might be our last cool season grass. Every, every, most things I read said, you could never do this where we are too hot, too hot, too dry, too everything, because this is actually from the coastal areas of Northern California around Mendocino County. But I read enough and saw some examples of it being used in really hot parts of California. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try this in our Salvia Creek garden. And um, it's done okay. It's done shockingly well. So we'll see. Um, I think I might have, wait a second. Oh, this is the this is the first. I missed this. Sorry. Here it is at the bottom. That's you know a nursery picture, but at the top is at Salvia Creek Garden. Not so not so shabby, right? What an unusual, beautiful little grass. So you can see that there's one in the foreground and a second one in the background. And they're in full sun in the Salvia Creek Garden. Um, I say take a risk. If you can get some of these, take a risk. Even, you know, get 12 of them. Put six in one area and six somewhere nearby in two little islands and try them. I would do it in filtered shade. But these are in full sun at the Salvia Creek Garden. On the left, See the little guys? Do you see those three? One's at the bottom left and they form kind of a triangle. Those little green guys, I can't point at them. And then up on the right is spring, is later springtime. Can you see the, the, those plumes, those little feathers of that same triangle of grasses? And then at the bottom, you can see those grasses again, but dead of summer, August. They're brown, but they're not dead. They're cool season grass. They die back in the summer. Our last cool season grass. I have not grown this. I can't ever find it, but we're trying to get it for the sale and you can often get it at native plant nurseries. It's called purple three on. And on is a part of the, the blooming part of the grass. Purple three on, Aristida purpurea. Now it's evergreen, which means that even though it's a cool season grass, it'll stay standing and still have presence and structure even when summer comes and it's the end of the year, the end of the summer for it. One to three feet tall, it likes drought, it likes full sun. It has a lot of the delicateness of Mexican feather grass. So you might think about using that if there's, if you want something delicate. Um, Carolyn, I was thinking about this when you were saying along your front door path, um, this could be a great candidate, but guys, don't be shy. When you buy grasses, unless you're gonna use them as an accent, meaning like one or three, um, buy a bunch of them. 
because if you're going to mass them, you're going to need more than one or two to have an effect. And if you're lining your driveway or lining a path, you don't want to be more than three to four feet apart or it's not going to look right. Um, here's the purple three on again. Um, it's in the front along both sides of that path. Um, just lovely, right? Leans down with that pretty color. And that's just in, I guess it's in soil, but it's really, that's a very dry, very lean environment, that garden. You can see in the front to the left, you have your purple three on, and then behind it, you have a deer grass. So you have two grasses layered vertically that contrast with each other. And then of course that deer grass provides that beautiful um, screen behind which you see the hummingbird sage on the right and the larger sage, some kind of a, um, probably a purple sage or something like that, a Cleveland sage on the left. And then again on the right, you have your purple three on with your hummingbird sage on the right. This designer is gotta be Pete Vieix. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he's just a wonderful designer. And here again, you see it when it's blooming in the spring along the left at the grower. Then in the middle, you see it as it begins to dry out, the seed heads dry out and get that purple, purple look. Then on the right, it looks like again, that springtime, but wonderful contrast with that very, very contrasting um, succulent. Okay, those were cool season grasses, okay? That means during the summer they're dying or looking brown. Here are some warm season grasses and warm season grasses tend to be, um, a lot of the grasses that are native in this area are warm season grasses as well. Okay, so deer grass, anybody who knows me or has ever been to any class I've given knows this is like your Cleveland sages. It's like brushing your teeth in the morning, just buy a bunch for your yard. Um, put it in a gopher cage, plant it correctly so that the crown of the plant does not puddle, mulch it three inches deep, give it deep water once a week for its first summer and just watch it be spectacular and set off all of your other native plants. Buy it, plant it. We're going to have 90 of them at our plant sale. Deer grass. I didn't know it was so literal, but I guess it is. This is deer grass with celestial blue sage. And these deer grasses, I think I put a picture. Oh, I didn't. These deer grasses are literally poked between in the cracks of boulders. I just went to where I could find a little bit of dirt and I just stuck them in, caged them, put them between the boulders. Well, part of the garbage bags, but these big deer grass used to be along the path. So my path used to be there. I moved it over here. <laughs> So now these guys are over here, which is okay. This is but this I morning. I to show you how actually they can be pretty cool at the edge of an oak, you know, where it's not completely under it, not completely out from it. Deer grass are just an amazing feature that can serve so many purposes. Um, it's interesting because this one is in almost full sun and you can see how upright it is. And as you move in under the canopy of the oak, you can see that it's a little more floppy, hasn't gotten quite as big. And then you can see those ones. And the oak has gotten a lot bigger, so they've gotten more shape than they used to. But anyway, more than the garbage bags, but this is real life walking backward in the garden. And my vision was, 
this path going all the way from, oh shit, sorry, my, um, uh, over here, I just thought, okay, well, why not trace a path kind of along the canopy of the oak and line it with some deer grass, which grow under it naturally anyway for structure. So five years later, there it is. Okay, that's deer grass. Plant it, buy it and plant it. Well, pardon me? Okay, another wonderful warm season grass. Budalua, I just love the way that sounds. Um, 20 years ago, when I discovered natives, the nursery manager at Theodore Payne Foundation, where I was volunteering, said to me, Leslie, Budalua, Budalua, Budalua. And it never clicked until like two years ago. So, you know, it takes the time it takes. Um, this is a California native grass that is drought tolerant. It has this beautiful eyelash type um, flower. It looks beautiful when it's green. It looks beautiful when it's brown. It's deep rooting. You can plant it in plugs, which are itty bitty little plants, um, and create a lawn. And people do that. In fact, if any of you want to create a lawn here, this is my highest recommendation and Preston is trying it. I'm gonna show you a picture. You can buy plugs, like 128 plugs in a tray from certain nurseries and um, you stick them in and you water them until they're established and then you hardly have to water them at all as long as you're willing for them to be brown in the winter and you can mow it in the winter. Adorable grass. Now, here's Preston's yard. Preston didn't give me permission to use these, so I hope it's okay with him. I think it is. So along the left, do you see all of those kind of uniform green grasses? Those are Budalua gracilis. It's a selection, selection um, from High Country Gardens. I don't remember what it's called. He planted them last year and they're doing fabulous. Um, and that's the summertime. So, well, the, sorry, warm season grass. That's right. So, but anyway, um, yeah. And then he's combined them with some deer grass, as you can see to the right, those taller ones are deer grass. But if this area works for him and it did, he's going to plant out a larger area. He did have a turf grass lawn there. I think it was, it may have been Bermuda grass. He let it die. So in this area, I fenced it after I'd already planted most of these blonde ambition Boodaloo. Okay, oops. So Boodaloo, this community, because of Carol and Billy, we fell in love with a selection of blue grama grass or Boodaloo called blonde ambition because it's a more vigorous plant and the seed heads, instead of brown, they're blonde. I moved a couple of them and They've done well, so I peppered them through. I didn't mask them. So there's one, two, three, four, six. And I interspersed them with subshrubs, which are our sages, a couple of other things and perennials. And, you know, I like it. I think it's really pretty. So I may plant some more and really make it like a meadow, meaning perennials or annuals, but the bunnies eat the annuals, but interspersed with the grasses. And the grasses do really well when they have perennials with them, because what will happen is that you end up um, enhancing the fungal network underground when you plant these plants that kind of belong together. Uh, their roots know it and they form the mycorrhizal or fungal networks underground and then everybody benefits because they share resources underground. And because this is all underneath a live oak, it enhances the health of the oak and provides the opportunity for a healthy ecosystem. That's what I'm working on. Okay. 
That's Blue Grammar Grass Blonde Ambition. This is it at the Salve Creek Garden. How beautiful are these? So um, uh, the one at the right obviously is a close up, but at the left I was able to get a few. Um, and this would this would have been like June probably um, when you can drive along the street and just see these and they're so dramatic. Um, They've been terrifically successful at the Salvia Creek Garden. And Elaine's, the Salvia Creek Garden is our public garden in our community. Okay, another warm season grass. This is gorgeous. And I think it's the last grass. Um, it has a terrible name, meaning it's hard to remember or pronounce. Don't let that scare you away. It's called Alkali Cicatin. That's the common name. The scientific name is Sporobolus aeroides. Alkali simply means alkaline soils versus acidic soils. And we have alkaline soil here, most of us. And cicatin was the Aztec word for grass. So it said grass in an alkaline soil. I also looked up sporobolus and it means seed ejecting from the, the thing that holds it. So apparently um, in some of these species, the, the part that holds the seed dries and it spits the seed out into the air. Anyway, look at that seed head. Look at those blooms. Um, they have something called a panicle, which is a more complex compound flowering stalk. They get about three to four feet tall. They tolerate drought, although they enjoy some supplemental water. They were native down in the valley when the valley still had water. Um, I think they are still native down in the valley. They just don't thrive the way they did. Um, but in, in on bordering on wetlands, um, they enjoy full sun and they have stunning, unusual blooming stalks. So this is the story of how I first saw my first sporobolus. This was 2016 and I was in the demonstration garden at Intermountain Nursery. And as you can see, it was December, right? It was but I love walking around. And I was like, what is this? Because it's a grass, but look at that bloom. I was like, whoa, I'm from Miami. It almost looks like a tropical bloom. So I looked at it and I asked Bonnie and she was like, that's sporobolus, which I could never find. And then finally, I went back this year in January. I was like, I wonder if that original sporobolus is still there. And I went back and there it is. And the clump is much larger and it's still there. Um, and I just thought I would share that part of the love story. Um, so up in the top left corner this year in this new part of my garden, that picture in the top left corner, you could see the little clumps of brown in the front. There's four of them around the bird bath and then toward the back. One, two, three, four. That's how they looked in the containers. They're a warm season grass. So in January or February, when I planted them, they were dormant. So all you could see was those dead things. And then on the right, we have another. This is a new area. I mean, an area in my new deer proof garden, but actually a lot of the things I'm showing you are fine with deer. This area, you can see right here, I planted four or five, four, I think, alkali cicatin, the Sporobolus aerodes. It's really hard to capture their beautiful blooms, especially when they're this young. But they've done well. There's uno, those, trace, and quattro over there. Preston was here, he had a great idea, which was, look, you got your fountain here, which by the way is powered by a solar pump. He said, why don't you plant a bunch of the Boudalua gracilis, just a bunch of it so that it really looks like a grassy area that'll marry well with the water. I mean, even though they're a dry, they like it dry, this water doesn't pour over. So it'll just look sort of green and grassy and I'll leave the sporobolus just those four because supposedly they get huge. Also, they tolerate water. They even want more water 
than the Budalua will, but the Budalua will be fine with more water. We'll just keep them greener. So that was Preston's idea. A lot more grasses to make it look very grassy in there. Okay. Questions? We could take just two or three minutes if there are questions before we move on to a couple of sedges and rushes. Okay, uh, deer grass are nibbling, Bev's uh, deer grass are nibbled right to the uh, cages by either rabbits or ground squirrels. Is it because they're young and small or is that something that? Okay, so happen? deer grass never used to get nibbled. They do now. When I, when I plant them, I now cage them for their first year. And needle grass, are they better planted in sun or shade? Sun, but they will tolerate part shade, but they're a full sun. They're a full sun dude. All right. Thanks. Okay. Here we go. Sedges. This is a fabulous plant if you can find it. Um, it's a specimen. Um, it's evergreen, meaning that even though um, it's just, it looks, it looks either this way or brown, but beautiful and structural all year. Um, it can get really big, but it does need water. Like if you have a dry creek bed that gets extra water, stick it there. Um, great accent plant. San Diego sedge. Remember sedges have edges? Carex spisa or spisa. And I think I show you. Okay. At the bottom of this slide, see where it says butterflies and moths hosted by Carex spisa native to California? On calscape.org. When you look up native plants, they show you the Lepidoptera that are that use these plants. Um, just to remind you how important native plants are to our native fauna. Ugh, I love this plant. That's one on the left that I had a young one that I had in my garden that I didn't cage and the squirrels got it. But even young, I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, and then in the middle, container specimen. Then on the top right, you can see the bloom. It almost looks like a cattail. Um, it has that beautiful, beautiful blooming stem. Now, here's another, here's a sedge that's used in a lot of areas of California for lawns. It tolerates some drought. You could try it here, could be tricky could be too hot and too dry, but it is used in other areas. This is Los Angeles, which I know we're not Los Angeles, but you st it's still worth trying. Um, this was a designer. This is the way it looks on the right. It's unmowed. And then on the left, you can see, um, starting from the top left, these were flats of babies, baby field sedge. Then you can see how small they are when they plant them. And then they had to get rid of their other grass. And so they used newspaper um, and covered it with mulch. And you can find methods of getting rid of your lawn using doing it that way. And then at the bottom is a newly planted brand new little plant. Then they obviously they have irrigation and uh, it became this beautiful native lawn where insects and other fauna will feast on the seeds and um, it's very drought tolerant compared to a normal turf grass. That's Carex pregracillus, um, California field sedge. And there's another lawn, not here obviously, but those are oak trees and a really dry, we look at that area that he's on, it's, a, it's, a, it's not exactly a loamy soil. Okay, rushes, save the best for last. Common rush, Debbie Welch, are you here? Is Debbie Welch here? Debbie Welch has this growing native in her yard. She's over on Horseshoe up John Muir um, near a stream, a seasonal stream. And she just has these, just huge stands of these. Um, it's Junkus Patens. It's a reed, a rush, excuse me. It is a rush and it 
looks like water, doesn't it? Doesn't it look like you expect it to be at the edge of the stream or even in a pond? It's incredibly easy to grow. You can separate it and make more. It's very architectural and contemporary looking if you want it to. It, you can starve these of water and put them in the sun and they'll live. They'll also live in, they'll also be fine in some shade. Not looking their best, but this is a patio of mine this week. I think that an animal went into the one on the right. They tend to be very upright and look architectural. I was very architectural digest a few years ago when I did this. It was like, yeah, more like far, farm homeowners, you know, rustic dream house. But anyway, <laughs> because this is such a wonderful plant on the left, you see, there's all these different selections. You can get light blue, dark blue, green blue, blue green, etc. Wonderful plant. Okay, here it is. On my patio, we enclosed it as a cat house, and I had planted a, a uh, Junkus patens there. You can see on the left, pretty thing. We just put in the cat house. On the right, several years later, Henry's in the cat house. You can see how that, how that Junkus has grown, right? It's big and beautiful. And we purposely added that gravel in those pavers because it looks so beautiful there. Okay. So there's that. And then this is what he decided was a really nice thing. And by the way, the rush receives the that receives that the drip out of my compressor that's right there. That's Henry and his rush. And this is what it looks like now. So whatever. Okay. Wonderful other rush, Juncus effusus. Anybody who was at my house when we planted plants two years ago, you guys planted these. They're down at the bottom of my property around the trough where the deer drink. And so there's extra moisture there and they've just thrived. And I'm sorry, I don't have any text. You can look it up, but basically stick it in the ground, give it extra moisture and you'll be happy. Okay. Plant care. Well, Elaine had this as a part of hers. Here's my plant care. Um, check this out and watch carefully. This was at Intermountain. Anybody see what's going on there? In the middle of that? Do you see that flowering stalk getting pulled down? Oh boy, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. Oh, it's gone. So anybody who wants to know if they should put their grasses in gopher cages. Okay, resources. Okay, Intermountain Nursery. Sometimes it looks like this in their grass department. Many of the ones we talked about are right there in small pots. We have Carex pragracillus, we have creeping wild rye, we have all kinds of needle grasses. Oh, I skipped several grasses. That's okay, we didn't have time. Okay, here is where you can get native plants around here. Louise Nursery in Visalia, as well as Intermountain in Prather. And his annuals online and in the East Bay. Ooh, not the East Bat, the East Bay. East Bay Wilds in Oakland. Las Pilitas, you can purchase them online and you can go to Santa Margarita and pick them up. And the Theodore Payne Foundation, you can travel to the San Fernando Valley and grab them. Consider seeds. Larner seeds, SNS seeds, and Theodore Payne Foundation are your sources reliable sources for California native seeds. Be very careful when you buy seeds. Commercial seed vendors often have God knows what in their seed mixes. So please be careful. Okay, let's take two minutes. I know this has been a lot. Let's calm down. Let's take two minutes and think about your yards. You chose a sunny spot and a shady spot. 
Write down, even draw the areas and the grasses you're interested in. It will stick in your mind if you write it down or at least visualize it. Two minutes. Guys, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Skip this, didn't mean to, just did. Another rush, Juncus occidentalis, spectacular. On the right, I planted two, I should have only planted one under a bird bath. Um, oh my goodness, right? Huge. And at the bottom, you can see our dry creek bed. Patty, can you see yourself? Remember, we wanted a Juncus occidentalis for that turn in the creek. We'll find one one of these days, but you know what? Who won't find one? I'm going to dig you up one from my yard. Duh, just thought of that. We'll put it there in the Salvia Creek Garden. Yeah, we skipped that. We also skipped, there we go, Melic grasses. Melica californica and Melica imperfecta. Lovely, lovely, cool season grasses that go away to almost nothing. They're delicate and beautiful, both of them. This one I love. This one I love. It's green and it has these beautiful white stems. And there's imperfecta. Um, Intermountain often has both of these plants. Okay. Okay. We're about to finish up, but we have to do so by remembering that all of our plans and all of our desires, we can make a lot of it work, but with the challenges we have, we need to accept those things we can't change. We do not live in a place where water is plentiful. We do not live in a place where squirrels don't eat things and dig things up. We live in the squirrel's world, in the gopher's world, in the snake's world, in these, in these worlds. We cannot change that. Let's accept it and change what we can, our attitudes. And let's have the wisdom to know the difference between those things. And with that, thank you. And I hope you got some benefit out of this. We will post it on the website. So Carolyn, I'm going to leave it to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to stay for a few minutes after if you want to talk about things or ask some questions. But if you'd like to go, adios. And thank you so much for coming. And plant sale, November 14th. And we're hoping to have an online component of it as well. You'll hear from us soon. Uh, Leslie? Yes. I, I, it's Elaine here. Um, I'll just bow out since it's beyond my, my usual bedtime. But <sighs> I wanted to thank you so much for inviting me. I, I see how you took the basic framework of my talk, but it's very much your own because your planting conditions and your species are so different. But it was beautiful seeing what you're growing in your part of the country. It's interesting because I have, well, I guess you saw the Sporovalis, the um, Muhlenbergia, the Elemis. We have those same um, genera, but, but the species are completely different. So beautiful. It was just fascinating. So thank you very much for inviting me. Of course. And thank you for being as gracious as to come. Oh, it was, it was, and thank you so much for your beautiful presentation. And let's be in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you all. Thanks, Elaine. Get some sleep. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye, she's on the East Coast. Nope, I think some of the questions have been um, around like understanding where some of these might go in regard to sun or shade. Got it. Okay, so generally... Um, most of these grasses are, many of the grasses tolerate full sun. And you can see that um, when we post the video, you can review it. Um, so you'll be able to see, you'll need to do some of your own research, but the blue grama grass, deer grass, 
alkali cicatin, um, your needle grasses, um, absolutely full sun and some others as well. Um, but they, many of them will tolerate some shade, but be careful in the shade because they'll tend to get lanky and they also won't bloom as much if they, if they really in the, in the wild, if they're in full sun and you give them shade because it's so hot here, you need to be careful and balance that carefully. Okay. Um, where is this nursery that um, you mentioned, uh, Leslie? Yeah. The, the uh, I forgot the name of it. You mentioned it several times. Um, probably Intermountain is what yes. you're talking about. Intermountain now, is in Prather, California, near Toll House. Um, where are you located, Karen? <laughs> in Merced. Oh, okay. So it will be a big drive for you. But okay. you, you might almost be, how, how far is it for you to get to Oakland? Uh, two and a half hours. And to Coarse Gold is an hour and a half, right? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't ever been to Coarse Gold, but probably. Um, so, yeah. Pra Valley. Yeah, Intermountain is Prather, but it would be, it'd be a long trip. But if you're going to do that, call first and make sure they have some of what you want. Okay. I'm, I'm so new to this and, and I really appreciate the presentation. I'm sorry I got in late, but it is really fascinating and, and um, I'm feeling a lot less overwhelmed with it. I'm so glad, Karen. Um, yeah. I'm really glad and we welcome you and you can you. find support here. We all, okay. we all struggle with it. Yeah, it, it's a big task. Um, it is. Yeah, I just moved back to... Um, to the States and from overseas. And my house was a rental for 24 years and the lawn is a mess and we're in the middle of a drought. And I thought, I just wanna do Xeriscape. That was the word I had in my mind for it. Right. And I came across your website, so thank you. Thanks I'm so much. I'm so glad because unlike plain Xeriscape, which just basically starts thinking is dry, mm -hmm. native plants actually become habitat where your life, your yard comes alive with, with wildlife. I don't know how it's gonna go over in my neighborhood, but I'm gonna be incorporating as much as possible. Of this. Well, here's what you do. If what? they want everything to look like a postage stamp, yeah. um, then what you do is you get one of those signs from California Native Plant Society for $20 that says native plants live here. Ah. So that it looks intentional. You can also um, get them from uh, National Wildlife Federation and the Xerxes Society of like, this is pollinator habitat or this is wildlife habitat. And then your neighbors can understand that you're doing something intentional as opposed to just letting weeds grow in your yard. Yeah. And if you put a path in, that always helps. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I was going to suggest to Karen to maybe she can come to our plant sale, which is closer than Prather. Your oh right. Okay. Where November is it, 14th, Sherry? November fourteenth uh, in our community, and you're on our list now, so you'll get all the publicity. Okay. Yeah, and my um, so my sister's partner um. Uh, goes to school in Merced, and I, I'm pretty sure that he's about 50 minutes to an hour away. Okay. okay. And we're 50 minutes from where? Uh, from our from our community in Yosemite Lakes Park, which is oh. school. Yeah, where where okay. the plant sale will be. Okay. Thanks, Edward. Hmm? Great. Okay, taking notes here. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Nope. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And um, okay. Uh, thank I'm, you. Actually, oh, I want to save these questions. Oh, uh, hold on. Edward, what plants would be good to use in pots? All of the all of the bunch grasses we named. Um, 
I mean, even just a single needle grass, as long as it's not a huge pot, looks beautiful in a pot. Yeah, we've been thinking about doing, you know, kind of um, replacing where we had all of those, those boxwood, I think they were. Yeah. Or something like that. Um, and just doing gravel in front of the house and then just pots. Yeah. And um, with the height on some of those, I feel like they'd be really pretty. Absolutely. Great idea. They do great. If you could find San Diego sedge, but you know, that's okay. Deer grass will do great if they're large pots. And yeah, you definitely can. Yeah, I gotta say, you know, um, I wasn't a, like a huge deer grass aficionado until <laughs> until now, you know, after a whole year here, I'm like, look at that. That's it's still I've got green in my yard and <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking. It's Beggars yeah. can't be choosers, Edward. <laughs> it's a little bit like that. Yeah, that hill where it comes down in front of the house. I'm almost wondering if maybe I just plunk a bunch of them up that hill. Yes, you can intersperse those with buckwheat and sages and seed poppies. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. Edward, thank you, dear. It's great to see you. Thank you. you too. You're so welcome. Um, bye bye. Uh, uh, seems like do rushes withstand freezing temperatures? Yes. I don't know if Maureen's still here. Um, uh, oh boy, opinion on peak muley grass. I was going to say something. Nikki, are you still here? You are. Yes. Pink muley grass, it doesn't belong here. And furthermore, it, um, it, uh, it's, I think it needs lots of water. That's what people call muley grass. It's the, it's the, it's the one that all the California nurseries sell, Muhlenbergia capillaris. It's this pink um, one. It does great in the East Coast, but not here. It's not a plant for here. Thanks for asking though, and nice to meet you, Mickey. Thank you. Sure.